Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to talk about some five star books that I have either never brought up on the channel or have come up on the channel like very rarely just in passing. So I tried to think of some books that I either read a really long time ago or books that are in genres that I don't bring up as much on the channel because on the channel I mainly talk about adult fantasy because that is primarily what I read now. But through the years I have been interested in a wide variety of books and so I thought that it would be nice to talk about some of the ones that don't get as much airtime. And there are actually a lot of books like this, so I think I might make a couple of these videos if people are interested. Sometimes it can be nice to go and look at a backlisted book, maybe one that hasn't been talked about as much. I know we all tend to get excited about the same things and then we see people talking about a book and then everybody starts picking it up, which is amazing. And it's really fun to watch everybody's reactions and hear about it. But it can also be nice sometimes to think about books or pick up books that you haven't heard as many people talk about. So for today, I think I have six, uh, six books that I, like I said, have either never talked about or have talked about only in passing. And the very first one is one that I know I have talked about at least a little bit, but I have never gone fully into it. And that book is Nation by Terry Pratchett. So for anyone who's been following along the channel, you know that I am finally getting around to reading Terry Pratchett's Discworld books. This is a series that intimidated me for a long time, not because of its content, but because of just the breadth of novels that were available. And I finally decided to start with the death books and I have been really, really happy with that. But about, I don't know, somewhere between 10 or 15 years ago, I had my very first experience with Terry Pratchett. This was before I even read Good Omens, which is his book that he co-authored with Neil Gaiman. And that was his young adult slash coming of age novel, Nation. And I don't hear a lot of people talk about this one. I think maybe because it is categorized as young adult, but this is an absolutely phenomenal book. This book is one of the few books I remember, I, I don't remember everything about the plot, but I remember exactly how I felt when I finished it. And it was that I thought that in terms of writing a coming of age story, I could not have hoped for anything better. And I remember having the feeling immediately afterward of thinking, I wouldn't change a single thing that Terry Pratchett did in this book. And that is not a feeling that I have frequently. Like I had a very visceral kind of emotional reaction to this book. And I can't promise that everybody will have that same reaction to it, but I just remember feeling entirely wrung out by this story and just loving it, wishing that I could erase the entire experience and go back and read it again from the beginning. The premise is very simple. It's about a young man named Mao whose village is caught up in a typhoon. He's right at the cusp of manhood and he's supposed to go through with a ritual that will help him pass over from being a child to being a man. And on the eve of this ritual, there is a typhoon that hits his island and his entire tribe is wiped out. As he is kind of coming back to consciousness, he discovers a person that he describes as a ghost girl. And this is a young woman. Oh gosh, I forget her name. Ah, I think her name might be Phoebe, but she's a young woman who has been through the, the same storm, except she was a passenger on a ship, on a steamship. So she was washed out to sea. She lost her entire crew, the people that she was traveling with, and she is washed up on this island. And what happens is that the two of them have to find a way to communicate, they have to find a way to survive together and to move forward with their lives. And it explores, like, like all Terry Pratchett's books, the plot can be a little bizarre, and I think intentionally so, but if you look at the underlying themes, the use of language, it's just lovely. And this, like I said, was such a rewarding reading experience. I have always wanted to go back and reread it, uh, but I've never bought a copy. So maybe sometime this year, I will purchase a copy and do a reread of this book to see if it resonates with me the same now as it did when I was a young adult. But based on the feelings that I had when I finished it, this is one that I would definitely recommend. The second book is actually a work of historical fiction. I don't read a lot of historical fiction. And when I do, I actually actively avoid reading books about World War II, just because I think that the market is saturated with these kinds of stories. And obviously if there's one that kind of rises to the top that people say is phenomenal, that offers, 
a different look into the story, then I will absolutely read it. I just have found with some of the real world book clubs that I have been involved with, I have read a bunch of World War II, of historical novels set in World War II, where people don't put effort into developing their characters or developing your emotions because they rely on the fact that that this was such a sad horrible time that the events of World War II is is what is expected to bring the emotion out of you and so I don't find myself connecting to the characters because I feel like the authors have kind of used the historical happenings to bring out the emotions in their readers and so I don't get a lot of I don't get a lot of anything out of reading those books because I feel like they don't bring, they don't teach me anything, the characters have not been developed, and I'm already sad about what happened. I have read enough historical, like actual historical documents throughout university or have read enough books that I do really love set in that time that I feel like they haven't brought anything new to the table. But when I was in university and I was completing my the portion of my degree that was my English degree, I had to read some books written by Newfoundland authors. I am from Newfoundland and so there was a course that was primarily focused around authors from Newfoundland. And one of the books that I read was The Wreckage by Michael Crummy. And this is a book that is set in World War II. And again, I think that this is an absolutely phenomenal book. If you enjoy historical fiction, if you enjoy in-depth character studies, if you enjoy narrative structure and narrative decisions that go against common convention or that surprise you in some way, then I really think that you would like this book. This, the setup of this book seems very basic. It seems like a very classic um, romance set in the era of World War II. And it just uses Newfoundland, which for anybody who doesn't know, uh, Newfoundland did not officially become a province of Canada until 1949. Uh, so this is kind of pre that happening. So just to set some of the historical context, for the time, Newfoundland was still part of the British Dominion at that point in time. So a lot of the politics and kind of the social issues um, are a part that is all kind of embroiled together. That all adds to the social lives and what's happening socially to the characters. And Michael Crummy gives us a story that is rich in that kind of historical socio-historical context. Like I said, he gives us characters who are fully developed and villains who can be both very cruel and sympathetic at the same time. And I think that he just does things with a narrative that are very innovative. His books in general, I have read a few of them and they, they all tend to, to follow that pattern. He's an author that I really admire. I think that he does really good work. And if you are at all interested in that period of time and you feel like you have kind of exhausted yourself on historical fiction set in that time period. This is one that I definitely recommend. I This was a book that I studied pretty extensively, wrote a number of papers on in university. There's a lot of richness in terms of the character profiles and that's what really appealed to me when I was reading and studying it. And it is one, again, that I would certainly recommend for anybody who is interested in historical fiction. Then for the next one, the next book on the list is a young adult novel. This one is Daughter of Smoke and Bone. So this is getting a bit of a resurgence, I think, on YouTube or on BookTube because it has had some new covers re-released. I don't know if it's an anniversary. I read these a long time ago, but I can't remember what year they came out. I think the third one came out in 2014. Uh, so I, I would assume that the first one probably came out in 2012. This is a YA series that I put off when I, back at a time when I was reading a lot of YA, I put it off for a long time because I had heard that it was about angels in love. And I had no interest in angel stories. And I actually saw, funnily enough, Patrick Rothfuss give like a glowing review slash recommendation on Goodreads. And so I thought, wow, I maybe I should pick this up. I Maybe I will like it. And I picked it up and I really, really loved it. Like I said, this is a bit of an older YA novel, so it's about 10 years old now, and it follows a young woman named Karu who lives in Prague. And she 
<laughs> she has a kind of secret and magical past and upbringing that she doesn't share with her other friends. And I don't want to give away a lot about the plot of this one, because if you have come this far and you have never heard of it, you have never read it, then I think that it, it's a good book to go in kind of blind. Um, I will say that it tackles the kind of insta-love trope in YA and I think pulls it off in a really interesting and unique way. It has one of the coolest magic systems. Like in a time before I read a lot of adult fantasy and didn't really have that much experience with really complex magic systems, I thought this one was really cool. It is still pretty soft, like there's not a, a ton of structure to the magic, but it just does something really cool with magic that I had not seen before and really appeals to a lot of the things that I enjoy in fantasy. So if you feel like we have pretty similar fantasy tastes, if you don't mind really lyrical prose, because this definitely skews like all the way over to flowery, um, and if you don't mind romance being a very central theme in your fantasy stories, then I cannot recommend this book highly enough. I really, really love this. This is one of my favorite YA fantasy books, and I really enjoy the whole series, to be honest. So if you have not read this and you're looking for something that is not as dense, not as deep, you're looking for a break from your adult fantasy reads, then I would absolutely 100% recommend Daughter of Smoke and Bone. And continuing on the YA fantasy train, just for another recommendation, the fourth book that I wanted to talk about is called Serafina by Rachel Hartman. This is a book that is going to be polarizing. So I'm going to say that like right in the beginning, I truly and genuinely believe that this is a book that you will either love or you will hate. Like I don't feel like Serafina is going to have a lot of I don't know, three to three and a half star ratings. I could be wrong. I haven't even looked at Goodreads to see if that is true, but it's just such a particularly written book that I feel like it is either going to absolutely resonate with you. For example, I loved it, gave it five stars. My dad absolutely loved it. He does not give things star ratings, but he, he really loved it, was excited to read the companion book. This is a duology. My husband, I think he got like two chapters in. He was like, this is so boring. How do you make dragons boring? And that was it. So go in knowing that, you know, this could be hit or miss for you. But this is, as I said, a dragon centered YA fantasy novel. It takes place in a world where dragons and humans have formed a somewhat peaceful coexistence. They have been coexisting for a couple of decades. And the anniversary or kind of the the re-signing of a peace treaty is about to come up and our main character whose name is Serafina is kind of straddling the world between is kind of straddling the line between the human world and the dragon world. Dragons are kind of Vulcan-esque in this book series like they're very aloof very closed off from their emotions very proper um, and they can assume a human form but they are very rigid they don't give in to their emotions so even though they can appear as humans they do not you can you can definitely tell the difference between a dragon and a human and so Serafina is kind of caught up in all of the politics that are involved in the signing of this upcoming peace treaty or the continuation of this peace treaty and what unfolds is a story that explores agency and personhood and what it means to be yourself, what it means to hide who you truly are. There is an undercurrent of romance, but I wouldn't say that that is the main focus of the novel. And there is a lot of political maneuvering. It would not be as intense as some of the adult fantasy uh, that people tend to read. But I think that in terms of YA fantasy, it probably leans a little heavier on that kind of mystery slash political element than they than they tend to do in my experience. But I really, really love it. Rachel Hartman writes amazing female characters and just that exploration of agency and what you want to do with your life and the struggle to know what is right for you. I think that she manages to balance that really, really well. And I really loved Serafina. I enjoyed the second book as well, which I think is called Shadow Scale. Um, so the duology was lovely for me. And if you enjoy books that can be a little slower paced if you love dragons and there's actually a lot of exploration of music in this series too so if you love dragons you love music and you don't mind stories that are a little bit more slowly paced then i would definitely recommend giving this one a shot the fifth book that i'm going to talk about 
is The Fireman by Joe Hill. So for anybody who doesn't know, Joe Hill is the pen name of Stephen King's son. And for me, this was my first introduction into one of his works. I love Stephen King and I read this one, I'm going to say probably like five years ago and it was the first time that I had read anything by him. And I was really nervous because I didn't know if I was going to be comparing it to his dad's work. I didn't know if I was going to have my expectations too high, if it was going to seem disappointing, if I would be able to be impartial as I read through. But I really, really loved it. Well, obviously these are all books that I gave five stars, but I was really happy to give this one five stars. I thought that his writing was reminiscent of his dad, but definitely had a style that was his own. There were a couple of nods to the multiverse, actually, in the Stephen King multiverse, if you are a Stephen King fan and you are interested in seeing that. But overall, I think that he just inherited his dad's ability to tell a really good story. This was very entertaining. And much like when I am reading giant Stephen King novels, this book was, I, I think, around like 800 pages. And I read it so quickly. It flowed so well. The basic setup is it's kind of stand-esque, actually. I don't know if it's supposed to be like a nod to the stand, if it's supposed to be him paying homage to his dad. But there is a disease, a, I think it's a... A, a spore like a like a pollen almost that can travel through the air and it's called dragon dragon fire dragon shimmer something it has like a fire slash drag dragony type of name and when it infects you it burns you up there's spontaneous combustion so it burns you up from the inside and there is a telltale mark so you start getting these like golden flecks on your body and that's how you know that you have been infected and so we follow our main character, who's a young woman who is married and pregnant, and her and her husband had made this pact together that if they ever got infected, that they would end their own lives because they didn't want to progress, they didn't want to harm anybody or cause anybody else distress by them, you know, spontaneously combusting. And our main character does find out that she is infected, but this happens after she finds out that she is carrying a baby. And so now that she is pregnant, she does not want to end her life. She wants to see if she can carry her baby to term and leave her baby with someone for them to take care of him or her after she has gone. Her husband, after he finds out that she's infected, becomes like overwhelmed, is incredibly upset, feels that she has pass this along to him and is trying to kill him and so he leaves and leaves her on her own and so she is stuck on her own and kind of in the background of all this happening um, there have started to be these squads of people that are called cremation squads so they go and hunt people down who have been infected with this illness and kill them so she has to try to escape these cremation squads and as she's on the run to try to keep herself safe and her child safe she meets someone who goes who's known as the fireman and he is dressed in kind of like a fireman's jacket and he has been infected with this illness and says that he has a way to control it so he tells her that he is able to control the illness and so she decides that she wants to kind of join forces with him and see if she can find a way to control the illness within herself and save her life and the life of her baby so it's really I would call it it's almost like a dystopian thriller I guess it's it's definitely faster paced than The Stand. It has that same, um, you know, pandemic feel where you have an illness that's kind of spreading across the population. There's mass hyster hysteria. People are reacting in different ways, but it's very, very fast paced. And we're not following this like giant cast of characters as we did in The Stand. But that's the book of Stephen King's that I can kind of relate it to the most. Maybe I guess we can call it like a combination of The Stand and um oh gosh what is his other one called the fire one with the young girl I don't remember but a combination of those two Stephen King books if you like Stephen King if you like those kind of like dystopian-esque thrillers then I loved this one I thought it was very fast-paced definitely a great palate cleanser if one can call an 800 page book a palate cleanser <laughs> Uh, and then for the very last recommendation, this is book number six. I have talked about this one briefly. I included it in my Christmas book guide, I believe. 
And this book is called Fates and Fury by Lauren Groff. This is contemporary or literary fiction, if that is what you would like to refer to it as. And I read this one also around the same time that I read The Fireman, probably. So probably about five years ago or, or so. And I loved it. I had no idea what to expect when I went into it, but I really loved the premise, I loved the writing, and I loved the narrative device that the author used. So basically what this is, is an exploration of a marriage. And the book is told in two parts. So it's told from the point of view of the wife and from the point of view of the husband. I think the husband's point of view comes first, and then you see things from the wife's point of view second, but I, I'm not absolutely sure because like I said, it's been a long time since I read this, but this follows two people who are very flawed. So if you are thinking about picking this up, just go in knowing that you probably won't fall in love with either of these characters. That being said, they are very well written characters. They are very dynamic. They are very nuanced. They have hugely, I don't know how to say it, like it just, interesting personalities. They are very interesting to follow and their relationship is incredibly complex and shows us the changing nature of love, what it means to be married, what it means to be in a relationship and the idea that you can never fully know someone outside yourself. You, even if it is the person that you feel you know the best in the world, you cannot know everything about a person. Now, do I think that everyone's marriage is as dysfunctional as the one that is portrayed in this book? Definitely not. But it does have some interesting things to say about sharing space, about sharing a life, about how what you wish for and what you want out of your life can change over time and how that impacts somebody that you have, you know, decided to tie your, your fate, you know, you've intertwined your fates and how your choices and how you change as a person can impact the other member of that partnership. Um, I really, really like this. It's been a while since I read it. Like I said, I just remember that I didn't love either of the characters. I thought that they were incredibly flawed, but I loved the way that the book was put together. And I really like books that toy with the narrative structure like that. If there's something interesting or unique about the way that the book is written, then I will find that appealing. I, like I said, this was five stars for me and I would definitely recommend it if you're looking for something a little bit different in terms of your reading experience. But that is six. I don't want to go on too much longer, but I do have tons of books that I have read and loved in the past. So if you enjoy this video, then please let me know. I would be happy to put together some more like this. If you have any books that you read 10, 15 years ago that don't get brought up as much on booktube, but that you would love for more people to read, then please feel free to leave them in the comments and I will definitely add them to my TBR. And thanks for watching. I will see you with another video soon. Bye.